welcome everyone to uh, our library public forum here on Monday, February 22nd. Thank you for everyone that was able to join us. We will be recording this and posting it for anyone that wasn't able to join it. Uh, and we will also be sharing out any of the materials that we share on the screen tonight. So you don't have to feverishly take notes. We will make sure that you have access to this presentation. So uh, with that, I'm going to jump right into the agenda. Um, so we will go through a quick presentation just to make sure everyone has the information on kind of how we got down this path, why we're looking to make this change, uh, and some of the supporting information to go with that. Um, once we get through that, I uh, caution you, it is a lot of numbers, so I'll go, I'll go as slow as I can, kind of explain it and break it down so that you know how we got here. And then we'll open it up for questions uh, for the council or regarding the presentation, and then after that we'll be uh, time for open comments and feedback, at which time we'll turn it over to you. So. That'll be our agenda for this evening. All right. So we're going to start with current state of our library services contract. So we currently contract with the Metro Library Network, which is uh, Cedar Rapids, Hiawatha, and Marion Libraries. The current contract has been in effect since July of 2018 and expires uh, in June of 2023. So that gives us two more years on this particular contract. Pricing is based on a per capita rate, and that takes into account our 2010 census data. So with that, the pricing per capita is based on us having 673 residents. So that is the 2010 census data that's used for our pricing. Our current pricing does include a decreasing discount over the term of the contract. So the first year of the contract, um, we had, um, available. Just, I'm going to give you the specifics. We had a 27% discount that then did decreased to 20% and so on until we have no discount as of the FY 22-23. So the last year of our contract, um, you can see that the per capita rate is the 38.69. So that represents the no discount at that point. So you kind of see as well how that total cost, the, the census data, the, the number of people hasn't changed. That is consistent with the 2010 number. So those increases are purely due to that per capita increase that has happened over the term of our contract. Contract pricing starting in FY24 will be entirely recalculated based on updated 2020 census numbers, which we do expect growth. Um, we've had a <coughs> residential development, as well as some other just empty lots that have been developed on. So we do expect growth with our 2020 census. Um, and then the per capita fees will be determined by the Metro Library Network at that time. So we don't know what those per capita fees are. I do want to mention that all of our funding for library services comes from our general fund. The proposed state is with the Anderson Center Point Library. So the contract is currently under consideration. It will require approval by both the Anderson Center Point Library Board as well as the Albernet City Council in order for that to take effect. Pricing is based on assessed value of the taxable property within the city of Albernet. So the initial cost is estimated to be uh, just a little bit over $8,000, and that is based on 30 cents for every $1,000 of assessed value. So if your home is worth $100,000, you would take 30 times 100, and that would be that cost for your home. So that's how the assessed valuation works <coughs> as far as our budgeting goes. Uh, pricing will increase in accordance with property value increases. So the, the contract is not necessarily a, a steady value or a stagnant number. It will increase as our valuation increases. Uh, this pricing structure is also aligned with our revenue structure. So we receive revenue based on taxable valuation. So that is how we get money from, from your taxes, from, pro from our taxpayers. It comes in based on that thousand dollar valuation. So this aligns with that. And again, all funding would still come from our general fund. And I'll explain that more here in a little bit. 
Um, so now we're going to dig into some of those rates and levies. Because these two contracts are not on the same pricing basis, um, we have calculated, so we've taken that metro contract, which again is the per capita, and we have calculated that out into what would be a taxable valuation levy rate, as we call it. So the Iowa State Code does set a minimum tax to be levied for library services at six and three quarter cents per thousand. So just under seven cents per thousand is what the city is required to, as a minimum, to levy for library services for our residents. Here you can see, so we did backdate based on our valuations from FY19 and FY20. We have also provided historical information on what that would have looked like had we been with Centerpoint. So for FY19, again, we had the greatest discount with Metro at that point. We had the 27% discount. So we were at about 19,000. That represents 80 cents per thousand out of our general fund. And the center point contract, should it have been in effect, would have been about $7,000, which again is that 30 cents. As that grows, you can see how on the Metro side, that levy rate fluctuates. Whereas on the center point side, the cost changes, that levy rate is consistent. So we always know that that 30 cents goes towards library services. Whereas with Metro, it, can var it has varied anywhere from 80 cents up to um, next year, it'll be $1.15 at the current rate. Next year is kind of an anomaly, and I will, we do have an asterisk in there that the valuation uh, has, was adjusted due to a tax incentive district for our recent residential development. So when that was developed, the developer has the right to ask for TIF uh, tax incentive money for doing that development. That comes out of our, that brings our taxable valuation down because those monies are, go to that developer. So that's less money that goes into our general fund. Does that make sense? Okay. So that is money we don't have available in our general fund next year. So you will also see that with the center point contract, that also causes the money we give them to go down because they are at that 30 cents. So whatever our general taxable value is, they get 30 cents. Whereas with Metro, the cost doesn't change, but the, um, obligation to our general fund then goes up because we have less money in the general fund but we still have to cover that cost so um, at the current rate it'll be as much as a dollar fifteen next year um, in 23 fiscal year 23 these are estimates so these valuations are estimated um, and again we still have a small tiff impact in 23 but we do see that as 98 cents for <coughs> the metro levy rate the far right column is represents that state minimum. So that six and three quarter cents. So you can see that even our center point contract is, um, you know, we're four and a half times the state minimum. Uh, in, in light of transparency, I will say that Metro has offered to freeze our current rate for the next two years for the remainder of our contract. That will save us a total of $5,208. Um, but you will also see on this chart that we have no idea what to budget for in 2024. Because currently we don't know what their rate is and we don't know what our census data is. So it's very hard for us as a council to be able to project what else we can get done, what other projects we can plan for and accomplish when we don't know what that cost is going to look like. So, and, um, so I did do the calculations. I apologize I didn't put them out here. I didn't want to throw too many numbers. But I will say, so if they freeze our current rate, so currently we are at $33.66. Our current per capita rate is $33.66. They have offered to freeze that for fiscal years 22 and 23. Uh, next year, that still represents uh, a rate of $1.05 per thousand. And in 2023, that would represent 85 cents per thousand. Um, 
as the council often has to do when we have some ambiguous information, I'm also going to give a conservative estimate for 2024 because we often do have to try to make projections. Um, and so if we were to estimate no rate change, so if, if Metro were to bring us back to the maximum, which is $38.69, um, and an estimate of 700 residents, so that puts us about 25 residents above our 2010 census, which I think I can personally count 25 people that have moved to town since 2010. Um, that puts us at our total obligation would be $27,000, $27,083. Which represents 99 cents per thousand. So we continue to see that rate grow. Uh, and again, that's a very conservative effort, uh, assuming no rate change and no more than <coughs> 25 residents added to our per capita. Okay. Now let's look at how this impacts our general fund. So, as I mentioned earlier, all library services are funded from our general fund. There is an Iowa code, so as much as there's a code that sets the minimum on what we can levy for, or what we have to levy for library services, there is a maximum on how much we can levy for our general fund. So we are maxed out at $8.10. We cannot levy for more than $8.10 into our general fund. Um, so what we have here is we've used those valuation rates and put that towards uh, to show the percentage of our general fund that is reflected there. So as you can see in current year, um, this contract requires 10 and a quarter percent of our general fund funding. Can grow to as much as 14 percent next year. Again, that will be this does not account for their offer to freeze that rate. So that would be a little bit lower. Um, and then 12 percent in 2023 unknown in 2024, whereas with the center point contract, because it follows our revenue stream, it's a consistent 3.7% out of our general fund, out of that $8.10. <coughs> there is an opportunity to, um, we can a tax for an additional 27 cents. There is a 27 cent tax for library services to augment that $8.10, but that is a voted levy. So we would have to put that to vote, um, and if that didn't pass, we would have to figure out how to, where else we can find that funding. Um, you might be asking what other expenses come out of our general fund. So here's an example. I didn't include everything here. There were a couple of smaller expenses um, that I did not put in here, but this does represent the majority of the things that come out of our general fund. So we have street maintenance and equipment. Fire equipment, that's for both new equipment and repairs to equipment. Wages, um, those are city clerk wages. I do not do public work, any public works? No. Okay. Wages for both our city clerk and public works director. There you can see the Metro Library bolded. Uh, and these are in order of the percent of general fund that is, um, that is held for that expense. Our Lynn County Sheriff contract, property insurances, uh, you can read the rest. So you do see, even today, so these, well, these are uh, fiscal year 21, which is the current fiscal year that we're in, that will end on June 30th of this year. So these are, these are not projections, these are actual, um, this is the actual budget and expenses that we're in right now. We're at 111% of that $8.10. There's an asterisk, because there's one on every slide. Um, for our fire department, for the fire equipment, we do have additional revenue through grants as well as a 28E agreement with the township. So that's where we can make up some of that difference, but the rest of the, the rest of that is funded strictly through that $8.10 levy for our general fund. Do you have a number for what that is? What, what is? On the, you said some of it can be made up on that 24%. Oh, on the funding? Yeah. Um, grants, we, we can't rely on grants because we never know what we're going to get. The 28E, yes. <coughs> we get about $20,000 a year. I do have that. Oh, I've got it here. Um, 
so for last year, the township fire contribution would be about $26,000. So about half of that. <clears throat> um, other things that are not currently represented that, so right now, um, the council is in the middle of doing some capital planning with ECI COG. So we're doing some capital improvement planning, setting our priorities, uh, trying to figure out what projects we want to prioritize next. Um, one that has definitely come up on everyone's homework is parks and recreation and expanding that within the city. That would also have to come out of the general fund. Um, so there are line items that don't exist today that we would like to see exist, uh, and all of that has to fit in with this funding. Um, library service usage, so the data, the last that we've received was as of December 2020. So we do receive a report from the Metro Network. Um, this is the first report that we've ever been able to get that includes address. And the reason that that's important is because they often, um, the reports contain county addresses that would need to be removed. Because this only impacts residents within city limits. The county has their own contract through the Lynn County Board of Supervisors. So county residents, anyone outside of city limits, is not impacted by this change um, and is also not considered as part of our 673. So when we look at this report, we did have to take those out. Uh, so you can see here that in the last six months, 33 unique cards were used. Um, I, I mean, you, you can do, you can add these up here, but you'll see Within the last 12 months, we had about 10% usage. And that does include PO boxes with no street address. Some of the PO boxes had street addresses on here, um, but some did not. And while we can assume that they're residents, they may also be county as well. Um, I get a lot of questions about services. And while I feel like services and your preference towards services is very personalized. I don't want to also just focus on the business part of it, so I wanted to include services that were advertised on each of the websites. Um, some of these services are currently impacted by COVID or the derecho, uh, but I really <coughs> want to consider standard offerings, so you will see that this does reflect their standard offerings, best to my knowledge. So I will put out there, I'm a library user. I've, I've not visited the Marion Library. I generally visited Cedar Rapids or Hiawatha, and I do also know they're building a new one. So that might change some of that Marion column, absolutely. Hiawatha is definitely one that um, is impacted with COVID. I think they are curbside only, but they do, in normal times, if we call them that, offer several of these services. Um, so the services in bold, are the ones that are truly impacted if you are no longer a Metro card holder. So access to their digital library, the ebooks, and the various online resources, you must be a card holder for those. Um, but again, Centerpoint also offers those things, and it's, it's the same. You have to be a card holder with Centerpoint in order to use their, excuse me, online resources. Ask a Librarian, Interlibrary Loan, and then Books by Mail. The idealized uh, checkout of physical items represents um, that item is governed by the State Library of Iowa Open Access Agreement. So, of course, we will, we will talk open access here in a second. Um, that is the item in question that is at the discretion of the Metro Library Boards to determine if they will deny a service, whether we can check out physical items as part of open access. Uh, the rest of these items, computer use, the, the various programs, meeting rooms, <coughs> all those things are open to the public. So those would not be impacted with any kind of contract change.
should have flipped the slide because I don't want to read this one to you. So I'm going to give you a second. Um, so here is information on the open access network. I pulled the purpose and this particular general provision from the terms of service. There's a hyperlink to that down at the bottom, so when you receive this digitally, you can, you can check that out. There are also links for uh, libraries that participate in open access, as well as other cities that contract for library services. All of that is public record on the state library uh, website. So the purpose of open access, it says, is to offer Iowa residents access to libraries all over the state so they have the convenience of using a library where they work, go to school, shop, or visit. There has been some talk. Uh, I know any cardholder with an Alberta address did receive an email from the Metro Network stating that uh, our services would be denied. I do want to be clear that as part of the provisions of their terms of agreement with open access is that a public library board may decide to deny uh, us as a contracting jurisdiction if they determine that the rate we're paying is inequitable. So those are their guidelines for being able to deny us service through the open access network. Um, that is not us terminating our contract with Metro. We definitely have, we, we own the risk that they will deny us access, but it is not a direct consequence. So us terminating our contract does not automatically mean that we will be denied service. They also mentioned in that email that um, there was a program proposed with the school and then it would impact that. I want to be very clear that the city and the school are two separate tax entities. We are two separate taxing bodies. Um, the city can enter into contracts that do not bind the school and vice versa. So the school is able to enter into contracts that do not bind the city. Additionally, a majority of our students, I do not have a direct number, but I can conservatively say that 60% of our students are either open enroll. We know that that's a 30% number because it's one we're proud of. Uh, so 30% of students at Albernet are open enrolled. So they live within a jurisdiction that is not affected by this change. I would say at least 30% of our students live out in the county. And again, this change does not impact county residents. They can still go get their metro cards. So just want those are two pieces that I think was causing some confusion was how that would impact the school and our stu excuse me, and our students, and also um, what it looks like should we get denied service. So you will see it says that we have to be deemed inequitable. So I just want to share some data. As part of that email, they included um, the average rate for the per capita rate for the, the metro citizens, as well as the average rate for any city that has a library. What they failed to include is the average per capita rate for any town that contracts for library services. And that's what you're going to see here. This is not an exhaustive list. What we have pulled here represents cities of similar size or proximity to Alvernet that contract for library services. All of these cities maintain access to the Metro Library Network through open access. They have not been denied access. They maintain it. What you'll see, um, it ranges anywhere from 92 cents per capita. Uh, our closest, our Lynn County um, neighbor, Prairie Burg is at $1.83 per capita, which again, we're, if we calculate that into a levy rate, is about $0.08. Cents. And so that represents about 1% of their $8.10. Similarly, Shueyville, which I, I, I would imagine that they have people that commute into the metro area, is at $9.19. Again, that $0.15 cent levy for 2.2% of their budget. On the right, you're going to see Alvernet listed twice. So we do have our proposed rate as well as our current rate so that you can see the comparison. Please note at our current rate, we are the third highest per capita. And we are the second highest 
percent of our general levy. So this represents a significant amount of our budget today. So Lake County, or um, the Metro Library Network does contract with two other jurisdictions. So they contract with Lane County residents we talked about. And you'll notice that they're at $22.51. Lynn County does, they, their budget is a little bit different, so they don't have an $8.10 levy. Their, their funding is just a little bit different because they're a county and they're not a, an incorporated city. So we took a liberty to calculate that percentage, but please know that that's not true. It, it's not super accurate only because they don't have an 810 limit, um, but that gives you the closest equivalent to what it would look like as far as their budget. So we took their general, their um, their valuation and made that adjustment or made that calculation based on what would be an 810 if they had it. So you can see at our proposed, while our per capita rate is lower, our levy rate and our percent of general levy is higher than Lynn County, who currently contracts with Metro. The other one that contracts with Metro is Robbins. So right now they are at $30.95. That represents 53 cents within their um, valuation, their levy rate, and then that's seven and a half cents of their general fund. <clears throat> so there's one city on here um, that I'm going to bring up that maintains access to the open access network, but has been denied service by Metro, and that is Palo. So Palo is the only other city that has ever contracted with Metro and moved their contract elsewhere. But we feel that this is not a direct apples to apples comparison for how Metro will consider our contract change. Because as you'll see, Palo is currently paying 29 cents per capita. They pay, they are levying one cent. So they are below the state minimum and that represents one-tenth of a percent of their budget. So let me remind you that the provision for the Metro Library Directors to deny us service through open access is they have to find that we're not paying an equitable amount. They made that decision with Palo. We don't know what their decision is. They've not discussed it at any of their meetings. Um, a decision has not been made, and so we will do our best. We will show them this information. We're happy to find all of the levy rates and all of the per capita rates for any cities that contract for service. There's a list out there. This is a this is a pretty good representation. Um, the one that's actually closest to us, both in their agreement as well as their size, is um, Hills. So they contract with the Iowa City Library, and you'll notice they're at a twenty-two dollar per capita but they're right at that 30 cent valuation, which is what we're, what our proposed is as well. And that is 3.8% of their budget. So we really feel like that our proposal to center point is still in line and is equitable for what we're going to be paying for library services, such that we should still be included in open access with the Metro. Should we get tonight, I'm gonna to back up just one here. Um, the other, the very last part of that provision is that we do have to be notified. They have to, all the Metro Library Boards will have to send their decision to the State Library Board, as well as us. They have to notify us of our denial of service in writing, as well as the rationale for that decision prior to making any action. So we will do our best to work with them and show them how even our proposed rate we feel is still equitable. So the next steps, um, the Anderson Center Point Library Board will need to decide on the proposed contract, so they still have to take action on that. The Alberta City Council <coughs> needs to decide on the proposed contract. We intend to do so or intend to have our discussion at our next regular City Council meeting 
which is going to be on Monday, March 8th, 2021. I do want it noted um, for anyone watching later. This is a different date. Normally we are on the second Thursday. We had to move our next regular council meeting, not because of the library meeting, but because of other budget provisions and budget schedules and publication schedules and all sorts of things. So um, we're just being as transparent as possible. It was not moved for that. It was moved for uh, so that we can get our budget filed in time. So we're trying to make sure everyone knows that this has been changed to Monday, March 8th. Again, you're welcome to attend that as well. Okay, I talked a long time. So now we're going to open it up for questions. So these would be clarifying questions regarding the presentation or any questions you have for council. We have a separate section for comments and feedback. So please reserve just questions right now. Are there any questions about what was just presented? Or do we need to, do you want to go over anything? Can you go back to what was available during open access? Like what services? The services? Yes. So, so the bold. The bold is you have to be a cardholder of okay. that library. Okay. So those would definitely be affected, and that is not a decision by Metro that we are waiting on. That is when I can definitively say that Metro, you have to have a Metro card in order to access those services. It's the italicized one that is being that would be determined by the open access agreement, is whether we can check out the physical items from their catalog. If you were to present something to the board and they denied, would you have an opportunity to come back with an appeal or even an appeal to the state? That is a great question. Um, I'm not sure of that process. We are hopeful that we would get an appeal with the state. So are you planning on trying to pursue services through Metro or do you think it's leaning more towards going to the center point contract? That is a very fair question. Um, I'm not going to allude to any decision. Um, council will, will have that discussion at our next meeting when it's on the agenda. What I will say, and, and I, I meant to say this at the beginning, so as part of our current state, we have uh, attempted to negotiate with Metro before. We've, we've given them three different, <coughs> different pricing structures or th things that would be a compromise but would still be able to be feasible and sustainable within our budget and we were unsuccessful in, in any of those attempts. So we, we attempted to uh, contract at the county rate. We attempted to contract for just a flat rate, as well as pay per resident um, that was interested in using the service. And, and they neglected, they, they did not reply to those offers. When, what year were those discussions? So I will say I was not involved in those discussions. I believe it was 2019. That's correct. Is that correct? Okay. So that would have been a previous mayor was involved in those discussions. All I know is the outcome. I don't know what was said. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Is there any indication that the center point per capita rate would change? I mean, it looked like it stayed for a while there. Would it? Do you anticipate it would jump at any point, or what would affect that? Yep, so that's a great question. So center point's actually based on valuation, so there's no per capita. Okay. Um, so they... But that, so that amount per valuation, would that change ever? The way that the contract is written that is being considered, the, there is no change. It's a perpetual agreement, so it's not, a, not anything. So our current contract with Metro spells out the fiscal years and how much we pay in it each year. And what we've proposed to center point is a perpetual agreement. So it would just, as long as neither side terminates, it will just carry on at that rate. Um, but even at an increase, by having it at the valuation rather than a per capita, it's easier for us to, to be able to budget and be able to, to see that expense and how it's going to impact other priorities as well. Because it's, it's at that valuation rather than a per capita. that doesn't, the per capita doesn't align to how our revenue comes in. So it's easier for us to say, okay, this 30 cents has to go here versus this $26,000, you know, 
how much is this in cents type. Does that make sense? When we're looking at how to spread that out across everything. It says that the Center Point Library um, does have interlibrary loans. Where do they, what are they connected to? So interlibrary loan is where you can request a title from another library. Um, they're connected to all open access net, all open as, access libraries. So you can find the list, and again, I'll, when you have this, there's the list of open access libraries on the state library website. So any library they have, in order for a library to be part of the open access network, they have to file paperwork with the state library to say that they want to. So once they've done that and they adhere to uh, the terms of agreement, then they can participate in it. So, so I do believe, oh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll get back to you. Um, if I remember correctly from their website, for Center Point, you get two loans a month for free, and then I believe it's like $2 beyond that for additional interlibrary loan requests. But it's not hooked to the Metro Library. Yes, Metro is an open, open access. Yep, absolutely. So then who absorbs that cost if you go over the two? Is that the patron or the community? That would be the patron. That would be individually on your account. And I will say for, for these libraries, in order to participate, their benefit for participating in open access is that they get state funding. So they get state funding reimbursement for <coughs> allowing people from outside of their network to have access and to check out materials, as well as um, state funding for reimbursement for interlibrary loan expenses. So that helps offset that for the libraries as well as residents. So does Metro know that you're looking at Center Point? They do. This is all public record, yes. And when you're looking at evaluations, um, I understand when there's new housing that they're not on the tax rolls for several years. And I might not have that correct, <coughs> but so are all the new houses included in the evaluation budget as well? So that's, and I may defer to Danielle on this because I don't entirely... Um, have the full grasp of that, but um, that's where you can kind of see Just one more. You can see that dip for 2022 because that's where we have the that TIF district so that's where we reserve That tax money in order to pay the developer according to our agreement with him. So we reach an agreement with the developer before they develop the property. Um, and so then they get, they get that deferred tax money. So you can see in 2022 that comes out of our general fund. But then that also would impact the value of that contract. Because we, again, that's not tax that's on payroll, as you say. Did I misstate any of that? No. Okay. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, so the city's um, property tax funding that we received from the, the county that they assess taxes on is based upon property valuations. And the new development, um, all the new houses that have gone up have increased our valuation. However, with that TIF agreement that we had, the developer has requested some of that incremental financing. And so there was about a $7 million adjustment to the property evaluations and what was available for the city to fund for the general funding because that about seven roughly seven million dollars um, of property valuation is then set aside to um, take that incremental financing to provide for that developer for the contract that we have. Does that help? that answer your question it does thank okay. you and that's why we also we projected for 2023 and 2024 um, because we anticipate those those new houses to be on the tax roll at that point any other questions we go really fast back to our end of our presentation Council, is there anything, 
Anyone would like to add before we move on to public comments? I'll start to my left. Nothing for me. Nothing. The only comment that I have is that in this year, we paid more for library service than we did for police protection. Questions? All right. Now we will move on to um, comments and feedback. So if you would like to make a statement, we ask that you please state your name and address for the record. Um, we have a five minute limit just to allow everyone an opportunity to speak. Uh, it will be mayor and council's discretion um, if we want to extend that limit. So that's definitely a possibility. So don't feel like you need to, to hurry. Um, we want to make sure everyone gets a chance to say what they want to say, but um, also that everybody gets that opportunity so um, I will ask council this is a public forum and we want your feedback and we are open to your feedback and that is why we were here so council I ask that we please um, listen to understand at this point so please don't feel like you're being um, we want to make sure we're silent you've listened to us talk and so we will sit here quietly uh, if you do have follow-up questions um, feel free to ask those the floor is yours. I told counsel at our last meeting I had to practice getting really good with silence, so. So we're going to take your time. It was a lot. I, I understand we feel a lot of information. Um, so, But we also want to make sure you have that opportunity. So we will sit here quietly. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, if you don't feel comfortable speaking up or if you think of something after the fact or anyone who's catching this video after the fact, I will be hosting office hours this coming Thursday from 4 to 5.30 here in City Hall. Um, that is completely informal. Just come in any time during that time. You don't have to schedule. But if there's anything you want to talk about further or run through something on the presentation, all this is public record and will be made public. So um, feel free to come in at that time as well. So I'll be here at City Hall from 4 to 5.30, the fourth Thursday of every month, but specifically this Thursday uh, if you want to talk about this. Uh, my name is Shelley Gopal, and I live at um, 121 Donald Drive. And I really think, um, I mean, it is a huge cost. I love the library, and when, you're, when you have access to it, I would say I go twice a month. But it's been kind of a challenging year. I'm not really sure that the numbers adequately reflect normal usage with the ratio mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the pandemic, because I think a lot of families utilize that for the family, and I'm not quite sure that if it if we have access through Center Point, that many people will participate in that because it's so out of your way to get anywhere. So, yeah. you know, I understand the costs, and it's not all about maybe what I want or what somebody else wants, but as far as families wanting to do things with their family, the libraries in Cedar Rapids are phenomenal. They have great services when they're open, and um, obviously with the new libraries, there are higher costs for them to support that as well. And so I think that's kind of food for thought as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that was a, a very good point. Mm -hmm. Something I've thought of also. <clears throat> I'll just follow up with her. I'm a Bartlett at 148 Donald Drive. And um, I just want to like let you guys know, the board know that my kids, I mean, they're teenagers now, 13 and 16, but they've grown up in the library. Um, and they were devastated to hear the possibility of not being able to just go and browse and check out books. Um, it, I do appreciate the fact that um, we are competitive with those other options um, that other cities have looked at, so that gives me some hope. Um, but I just, there's... Um, just something about being able to just stop at the library in between your errands. Just you know, you're running, the, running your errands and just sneak that in there. And there's no way that Center Point Library is going to be that option for families. 
Um, and then I also think about the homeschool families in the neighborhood and the community. I don't know that they even, if they even know that something like this is being considered, if the, if the word is getting out far enough. Um, but those in the in-home daycares that stop by and just pick up materials for their lessons every week, I just really hope that, I mean, I, I appreciate your looking into all the, the numbers, and I, I see now I understand some of your thoughts, so that's nice to, to kind of wrap my head around, but just something to really think about how convenient these libraries are, and the new library going up in Mary, and my kids are so excited. The Cedar Rapids one, when that was built, they couldn't wait to go and check it out, <coughs> and they were little then, but um, there's just something about having, going and looking at the new options and picking up that book and reading it, and um, I will say the pandemic has actually made my daughter a bookworm, so she wants the books in her hand, and it's been nice to be able to even just put something on reserve and I could grab it on the way home from work or something, so just some things to think about. I'm Kristen Kopis. I live at 225 Lori Drive, and I'm just going to go off of what um, she said as well. My kids are almost nine and almost five, and they were also devastated to hear about the loss, the possible loss of not being able to go to the library. I'm also a teacher, so like a life, like I, this is my 13th year teaching, and I'm an English teacher, so I wrote out what I wanted to say. So <laughs> here we go. So I'm familiar with the challenges that children face learning during a pandemic. The most important ingredients for times like this is encouragement and resources. And the list that you brought up of the different resources is, is fairly incomplete. There's a plethora of resources that you get with the library access card, including Ancestry.com, JobNow, VetNow. I have a comparison for you to look at, at the numbers between the Center Point Library and the Metro Library. Um, but it's important to have as much of those full things as possible and every resource in the world is critical to our understanding, especially during our current climate and during social isolation. When the libraries were closed, I delivered books to over 24 of my sixth grade students, Abby included, to get them the resources. <clears throat> and I, I really appreciate the budget and seeing everything lined up and like Amma said, I have hope that we'll still be able to maintain physical items, but so many people that have reached out to me via social media has said, we use our Kindle. I use it to check out books as an elementary teacher going to college, and I use these resources, and to ha not have access any longer is devastating. Um, the Metro Library provides ease of use, accessibility, online resources, and it's not just for young people, it's for everybody. It's for adult learners, family going on trips, and you want to take a mobile hotspot along with you, researching your family lineage, you can check, you can reserve rooms at the Metro Library, at the Cedar Rapids Library. I took a class of a field trip there last school year. Wanted to go back again last school year, but you know, COVID, and I would still continue to take students there. And I know that the point brought up about the high number of open enrolled students. But when I took them to the library, that was some of their first time going there. And I don't know if it's so much the access as far as we need to maybe promote the services that the Metro Library provides, because I'm going to guess when I show you this list of resources, you're going to be, you're going to say, oh, I didn't know they had that, but it's available. Ms. And Lopez, I, I don't mean to interrupt. We have that list. Okay. Would you, would you like me to bring it up? Sure. Okay. Is that you, from TJ? Do you want me to share? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'd be great. I'd print in some copies, but it'd be great for yes. everybody to see. We do have it, and have yep. it here as well. Um, so, Council, you do have that is this guy. This book has put a lot of work into it. I'm going to give her credit for it. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to That's you. okay. So you can see just the uh, hours of operations for one, the number of items, both digital and print. Let's see if I can get it zoomed in. Yeah, let's zoom it. <clears throat> the number of locations, just where you can drop off things. I mean, my husband's always running into Hy-Vee to get something or another to grill but he can always take back the library books. Um, I go to the library mostly, as a working parent, I mostly go on the weekends. And you can rent space at the Cedar Rapids Library. They have an auditorium that seats 200 people. 
You can have your graduation parties there. There is a cost for space rental at the Center Point Library. Um, and then if you want to scroll down, Bethany, there's um, the services that you had talked about that is available as well. They have all of these resources that are available to card holders, which would not be us if we went to the open access. And then I also included there, and you're welcome to send this out too if you want to send it out with the um, with what you send out later. But I said what those resources are. Um, I mean, Ancestry.com, that one's self-explanatory. And Pronunciator, you can learn a language. Tumble Books, that I know is a resource my kids use at in-home daycare. Um, but the overwhelming majority of our citizens in Alberta, they travel to Marion, Cedar Rapids, and Hiawatha for work, grocery shopping, doctor's appointments, dining, entertainment. And I think it's essential that the council recognizes the significance of available resources and the convenience of the Metro Library. In the last nine years myself, I started, moved here in 2009, I checked, and they only had my library card back to 2013, but I've checked out like 1,200 resources. I checked out books as a teacher for the students when the books are not there in the library. And they say, this is Copas, I really want to read this next book in the series, do you have it? Well, no, but let me see if I can find it for you. Or we can get it on student Chromebooks for them to use. And I know that the city and the school are two separate entities, but they do both work to support one another. And it's not that Center Point is a, it's not a bad library. All libraries are great. All librarians and library support staff are absolutely amazing. But the Metro Library offers a myriad of tools and advantages to the Albernet resi residents that can't be matched. Mm -hmm. They have an experienced staff who know the education business. They have a, their hard copy online resources are incredible. That number that was up there was 560,000 resources, and it's growing by 1,500 a month compared to 240 items in the Center Point Library monthly. And convenience is huge. We're going to continue to work and shop in Cedar Rapids, Marion area, and weekends are important for family time, and the Metro Library is open on Saturdays. This, these are COVID hours, but they're currently not, and they said these are our, Center Point says these are our hours until the pandemic is over. Well, When's that going to be? So I know this, that the future success of Albertet community is tied to two things. It's tied to the children and the ability to maintain being lifelong learners. There is a measurable value to what we are getting now, and the Metro Library system matches our needs, and I believe it's worth the cost. And it's important to embrace like the bang for the buck that we're getting. Mm -hmm. Appreciate Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask Kristen a question? Yes. yes you may. Do you know, is the school working with Metro? Not to my knowledge. Okay. I do know that the Metro said that each student in Marion and Cedar Rapids linked to their student ID card is a library account number. And so that they can use that library account number to get the digital re resources that they need direct to their computer. They piloted this year with the, Met the Marion and Cedar Rapids school districts. And their attempts next year was to push it out to other districts, Albertnet included. Carla McMurrin, 3234 Why Not Drive, Albernet, which is a rural address, so I'm a Lynn County library user, but we own a fair amount of taxable property in Albernet, so I'm considering that aspect too. Your presentation was wonderful. You hit all the high points. Thank the you. one thing I would like to add, if we could go back to the, the uh, screen that showed how much each um, town paid, that one, yes. You did not list Marion. They pay $49.69. So these are cities that contract for library services? Yes. Yes. Um, for, okay. For the service that um, Marion, Hiawatha, Cedar Rapids citizens pay for, Albernet would be paying $33.69 at the high end. Marion pays $49 for that same service. Cedar Rapids residents, $53 for that same service. Um, Hiawatha residents paid $107 for that same service. So comparatively, Albernet is paying less for the same service. Just to, to be 
I, I will that. say, we, we did not go into finding the per capita rate for any cities that own their own library. So these are these rates are strictly cities that contract for library services, which is the situation that we are in. And the provision for whether we can be denied access or not is specific to cities that contract for library services. Okay. I'm Jill Hunt. Um, I'm a count. I live out in the country, but um, I live at 2990 Arabian Road. But I just want to speak on behalf of the children's programs at um, in the library. As mom of four young kids, and like mom's kids, you guys have said, my kids grew up in the library, and they all just love to read. Um, like just the programs, like Mother Goose on the Loose, um, Play and Learn. Oh, the orchestra, the symphony ones, I can't remember. It's, but all these things that you have your opportunity to teach your young kids to, you know. Uh, I was a new mom here and didn't know anybody and met lifelong friends through just people who took their kids to play groups at the library. And I miss, you know, just going and browsing with the COVID hours. But, um, so yeah, I just think their, their kids' programs can't be beat, um, you know, just in a small town library. That. And we would not <coughs> excuse me, we would not lose access to those types of things. I mean those are publicly available. It's really just the cardholder specific uh, resources that would be that we potentially lose access to. J.P. Bosenberg, 214 Donald Drive. Um, I am an avid reader. That is my entertainment. Um, and I check out books all the time. Um, it is an awesome library system. When Marion went down because of derecho, the derecho, the library building uh, was shut down. They set up another building or um, in downtown Marion. They moved all the books that were not ruined to the Cedar Rapids Library. They are very accommodating. Um, they would put books out for you. They still do, even though we can come inside now in the um, downtown library. Um, I would miss it more than you can imagine because that is what I love. Center point, to hear that we could possibly still be connected to the metro system um, would be wonderful, but the convenience, I don't go to center point. The, the ability to run your errands, go grocery shopping, whatever, um, you can pick up library books. You can drop them off so many places. Center Point would absolutely not be convenient. I do understand the money, and if it's not fair, I don't know how they figure it, <coughs> and it doesn't seem like it is equitable, but I don't know. Um, I just would have a hard time without being able to go to the Metro Library System. Thank you for sharing. <coughs> Sorry, I have a frog. I had one more point I wanted to add, if I could. I just feel like, um, you know, when people look at the Alberta community as maybe where they're going to move, and they look at the schools, and they look at what other opportunities they have, I think that actually should be something that even could be promoted by the city, that we are part of this network if that's, you know, still what we are doing. I mean, I think it's, an, it's a value that is added just as much as having a good school system. It's just another thing that new families might look at when they come to this 
Thank you for bringing that up. So we do have it on our website. Um, okay. So we, re we recently redesigned our website, and by recently I mean about a year or two ago. Um, and as part of that, it was with that lens that we built a section mm -hmm. called Around Town so that new residents can kind of see what is offered, and library is the very first one listed there. Because, so, I've, I've lived here 15 years, and until I had children that got to about preschool age, I didn't know we offered the service. Uh, and I'm a frequent user as well. I have library books in my house right now, so I'm a frequent user here. Um, I think you're absolutely right, but there's also the element of we, we can't, make people go use cards or use them so we need to make sure we're being fiscally responsible with how we're using those resources and maximizing because we also want to continue to see town grow as well but um, you're absolutely right so we have made sure to, to include that on our website and make it as prominent as we can but all it says is that this is the library we contract with and here's the link mm -hmm. is that as much as we can do to promote the library I mean, it gives them then access, because then on the Metro page, so I think we link to the Cedar Rapids page, it tells them how to get a card and, and all the information that goes right, on. Right, but it doesn't it. necessarily say all the services that are outlined. I mean, you saw my research and, like, the time that it took me to do that, someone I consider pretty expert as far as using the Internet and how to cite sources and find all these things. I think someone that is not in that same, same case, you know, capabilities would not necessarily see the benefits by just simply saying, here's who we contract with. Appreciate your feedback. I'm, I'm responsible for the website, so I can look at adding more information. You're welcome to put what I have on there. To, to address that, the link on the Albernat website goes to the Metro Library Network, which is a very generic web page. You have to go one step farther to get to the Cedar Rapids link, the Marion link, and the Hiawatha link. The very generic Metro page, to me, looks very bland and does not entice you to go farther if you link individually to any of those three libraries, you get, wow. Okay. We can look at making changes to that page, absolutely. Do you have the numbers available for how many items were checked out in the last three years by Albernet cardholders? I, I have that number, I, but it, I don't. Um, so the report we have has their lifetime checkouts. Okay. So I if, don't have the actual. Sorry. Did I, I send that to you, TJ, with the the fiscal report that had the number of items checked out in the last three years? Yes. It's right here. Okay. I closed it. Sorry. There it is, yep. Okay. Yeah, so in the last three years, we've had 22,166 items checked out by Albernet cardholders. And the number that I received from the library was there was 176 people with Albernet li um, addresses as well as the Metro Library cards. And looking at that, that would be 25% of our citizens based on our population of about that 700 number. But that does not necessarily account for the fact that there's multiple people at a single household using the card. Like my house, we have one car, but there's four people that live there. Mm -hmm. So I think that percentage would in fact be higher. And then I also had those per capita numbers that were shared over here mm -hmm. earlier. But that's how many items have been checked out and in the last three years. So as I mentioned uh, when we talked about the usage report that we received. Yeah, I understand that. We do have to remove county addresses. There, okay, and everyone. I don't know what was removed here, but this is yeah, they you know, don't, a significant so number. All they filter for is the city of Albernet. Well, you'll know there are several county, I mean, there's a, a good uh, radius of county that has an Albernet address, right. but is not within the city. So, uh, but, but right. I also The number is probably that, somewhat inflated. Yeah, but, but I understand that's not information that you would have no. access to, so we appreciate you putting this together. But I do want it noted that, um, that that most likely does include county residents as well. Um, and. I understand. We're the same. I have the card, and my entire household uses it. But when we look at how our revenue comes in, we aren't paid per capita. We're paid per household. So that's also kind of a fair way to look at usage because we get 
so much revenue for the valuation of your home, not for how many people live there. And working at City Hall, um, I'll get calls from time to time from people looking to potentially build here, move here, um, new residents to the city wanting to know about resources. I just want to say I've never had anybody specifically ask about the library. I've had asked about trash, utilities, um, UTB ordinances, some random things that I don't even remember, but I've never had anybody specifically ask about the library. And I know it's important and it's a great resource. Um, but I just wanted to state that I do, sh I'm sure there are people who value that um, access to service, but just in working here and having calls from people looking at the area, no one has specifically asked about, you know, where does your city have library service or do they have a library um, within your town? So, and actually, why do you think that is? I just, I don't well, know. I mean, like, like if you were to guess, why do you think I people don't, don't ask? Maybe it's not important to them where the library is in relation to where they're going to build their home or okay. live. I wonder if it's too just something they wouldn't think to ask about. They, they would just assume well that be. everywhere you can, you'll have access. <coughs> Absolutely. To those, so. Absolutely. Just a thought. Do we know how many towns don't have access to the library network? Glen County area, I mean. The only town that we are aware that Metro has denied access to is Palo. Alright, so it's it's a fair assumption that no one would call and say, you know, what access do you have to the Cedar Rapids Library, assuming that basically everyone in Lynn County short of Palo has that access. Yes. Last call for comments and feedback. I was going to ask if there is more, if more information gets out there and someone has something to say, can they still say something at the council meeting on the 8th? Yes, great question. So we always have um, two, yes, we have public comments as part of our agenda every council meeting. So they would be welcome to address us at that time. Or again, if they want to come private audience, uh, we can do that at office hours as well. Is a, or I should say, when is a decision going to be made by the council? We anticipate this to be on our March regular council meeting agenda. On the 8th? On Mar Monday, March 8th, yes. As of right now, we, we intend to have it on that agenda, which will be posted 24 hours before the meeting. So if we go with the less costly option, what are the funds earmarked for in the community? I mean, what are we looking at for other needs that need to be met or that you're exploring? Yep, that's a great question. Uh, and I might open up a little bit to council because I've done all the talking. But uh, we are, like I said, we're working right now with an organization called ECI COG uh, that helps communities find grant funding and other things. And right now they're doing, helping us with a capital improvement plan. So we're working to identify those areas that we want to see growth uh, and to be able to prioritize those as part of our initial homework. So we're in, we're in working committee on that right now. Um, and as part of that, so then ECI COG helps us to try to put some numbers to what that would actually take. So a few things I can come right off the top of my head because I've seen everyone else's homework is um, we are going to need a new fire truck. Sooner or later, we definitely have one that is um, 1988. It is, it is causing us much maintenance. So a fire truck is definitely an upcoming priority. Uh, parks and recreation is something we, we want to expand as a city. I know we have a few through on the school properties, but there's <coughs> definitely something that we'd like the city to 
to own and offer or some more parks and recreation opportunities. If you'll go back to a couple of council meetings ago, we had a gentleman present to us about the possibility of a skate park, and the discussion was around do we need to offer more for uh, those older age groups, those types of things. So a lot of, a lot of discussion to be had there yet. And then um, disposition of the old fire station would be another priority, I think, that the city council will agree on as far as once they are moved into the new station. No, I don't have a date. Um, what do we do with that old building? Do we renovate that for City Hall? We currently rent this space. So uh, do we renovate that? Do we, what are our options there type of thing? So uh, those are some of my quick priorities. I will open it to council if they want to tack anything onto that. Uh, I guess I covered it. Okay. Did that help? Does Albernet just have the one TIF district? Currently, yes. Okay, so, and that will fall off in 2000, in 2023? No, so we, that just became an active district. However, um, we made a, a slight miscalculation when we asked for the TIF funding, and we ended up taking too much, not too much, we, we took excessive funding out of next year inadvertently. The form is kind of confusing and it was the first time we had done it and so essentially we're reserving that money ahead of time. So next year's budget's kind of an anomaly uh, but then we're we're saving in advance for those TIF payments that are going to have to continue over the next 10 years. 10 years, yeah. I think that's a, that'll be, those will be 10 year payments. But So those go into a separate fund. So we're going to end up next year reserving how much of that do we know? Right? Thirty-four thousand should be the same amount. But how much of the? We'd have to recalculate. So next year is an anomaly, but that is a recently active TIF district. TIF district. Did that help? Okay. We can get you more numbers if that would be helpful. No, that's, I I just wondered how long it would be before we would receive the tax value from that seven million dollars. So it'll be ten years. No, no, it'll show on tax roll. Right, but it, it won't be available for your budget. It, it will be a part of your budget that's not available to spend on something else. Correct. Can but I? Yes, if you can right. explain it better than I can. Yeah. So the TIF district, we let the county know how much funding we need to pay this developer contract, and then they take that uh, property evaluation and they say how much of that taxation or how much of that incremental value is needed to make that payment to the city to pay the developer. So um, when we let the county know that we have this district tax, dis incremental financing district started, they set that base, that frozen base, which is essentially the ground before any development was done, the value at that point, and then what it is now. And so, um, we hadn't requested any TIF funding on that new development until this next fiscal year. So we said, and there's a 10 year time limit on how long we can request the, those funds for. And so we'd already been started into that 10 years, but we still have to make that developer payment and it's capped at 250,000. So we said to the county, we wanna take all of that, what's available within that um, valuation for that incremental financing so we can make sure we can pay this developer. And so we didn't know what that uh, what that portion of the property evaluation would be in order to get that incremental financing. So we said we want all available funding from that district to be used for TIF. And so essentially that came out to be that $7 million of, of property valuation for that new development. So they withheld that from our um, regular property valuation that we could use to draw from for our general fund property taxation. And then next year, we'll have a set amount where, we'll, where we will say we need X amount of dollars, and I think it's roughly thirty-two to 34000 And then they will take whatever property valuation they need from that district and tax only that valuation to get that 
$4,000. So it's only a big chunk in this fiscal year because we requested all available in order to make sure we could encompass what we needed to pay that developer contract within that 10 years. And they gave us a worksheet to help us understand what, what we need to do going forward. I know, that's... Sorry, it's a, it's a lot. And we're glad she's here. <laughs> I, I've had to look a lot into it. There's a lot of um, numbers that go mm -hmm. into it. And if you have further questions, I can help you with that. Or county is um, also able to answer that for you. It's confusing. It's a lot. So I'm yeah, happy we, to... We won't see that being impact year over year. That was just this year because we requested all available funding. Right. And then we have a, a worksheet to help us determine what we need for the next 10 years, the ongoing. Thank you. Yes. I'm not going to speak on behalf of council, so they are welcome to speak up before we close out. I want to thank you all for coming and for your feedback. Um, this is why we're here. We wanted, we want to hear from you. Um, we appreciate all the work you've put into resources, and we know you're all passionate uh, with what you came with tonight, so we appreciate that. Again, if you think of anything else, we are all an email away, a phone call away, office hours. We are available. Um, we've got a few weeks yet before we intend to make this decision. So. Thank you all for coming. I have one more quick. I have not checked lately, but I understand there's been some conversation on the Facebook page of the city of Elbernet, and I wondered if the council members have looked at that. We do monitor that, yeah. Everyone? We, oh, I, I will also mention uh, uh, the city clerk and I definitely monitor. We are admins for that page, so we definitely monitor it. I think several of our council members are on Facebook and, and can see those. We have also received feedback um, from residents through emails as well, and that has gone to all of council. Good. So, Thank you. Yep. The Albernet webpage is the only Facebook page I follow because of <laughs> the world we live in. <laughs> so, similarly, anyone watching the video, you can shoot us an email. We will make sure, even if you just send it to Danielle or myself, our email addresses are on the website. We'll make sure that that gets disseminated to council as well. All right, well with that, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.